So you're all very welcome back um, after our really interesting session uh, this morning. I am delighted to welcome our Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly TD, who is going to address us, and we're really pleased that he was able to make the time to come here to be with all of you and all the wonderful work you're doing, and it is a tribute to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I'm really delighted to be here. I think it's a very... Uh, important day to mark uh, the work that has gone on so far. I know you've spent the morning reflecting on uh, the progress that's been, been, uh, that's been made. I'd like to start by thanking uh, John Saunders. Um, the outgoing implementation committee has worked uh, very, very hard. You've done important work. Uh, and can I really welcome Catherine as the new chair? I think it's going to be uh, an exciting time and it's going to be an important piece of work. And I want to uh, wish you, Catherine, and the committee uh, the very best in the, uh, in the time ahead. It would be remiss and probably quite risky of me not to mention my good uh, colleague, uh, my ministerial colleague, uh, Mary Butler, as well. Uh, I know firsthand of uh, Minister Butler's dedication uh, to both briefs, to mental health and older people. I can tell you that Minister Butler fights and advocates and champions on a daily basis for all mental health services right across the country. She is a powerful advocate. She is a powerful political leader. She uh, luckily has Pascal and Michael terrified, so they keep, <laughs> they keep writing the L checks which are very useful, uh, and I really do just want to, on a, on a serious note, I want to acknowledge you, Mary, and the, your ongoing work. So today's conference, of course, it marks the end of the first phase of implementation. It provides us with an opportunity to reflect. Some things will have gone well, some things will not have worked. Uh, in the way that it might have been envisaged in the, uh, in the strategy. And really, we want to reflect on both of those things, recognize what hasn't worked, and either change how it's done or stop doing some things, uh, and then really focus on the things that are working and make sure they go from strength to strength. I can tell you that from my perspective and from government's perspective, mental health services are an absolute priority. They have been a priority through every single year uh, of this government, uh, and they remain a, an absolutely core priority uh, to what we are doing in, in healthcare. The government is fully behind the national strategy. And I think the breadth of the program is worth a mention. It, it is vast. Uh, in some ways, it's daunting. Um, I remember launching it and looking at, I think we had about 100 recommendations, and thinking, this is not easily done. Uh, it is a vast piece of work, which, of course, is why we have an entire implementation uh, team and process in place as well. Um, but government is, is fully supportive of it, be it promotion, prevention, early intervention, acute services, community services, and everything uh, in between. The scale of our ambition shouldn't be underestimated. Um, it is a vast challenge. It is a complex challenge but it is an absolutely essential challenge for achieving what we all want, which is for Irish people, for men, women, and children in our country to be able to get the mental health services they need when they need them. Ultimately, that is what we are all dedicated to. I know that's what you are all dedicated to and what you dedicate yourselves to every single day. And so I want to thank you on my behalf as Minister for Health, on behalf of the Irish government, I want to thank you for everything that you are doing to roll out and improve and expand services so that people can get access to the services they need. Thank you all very much indeed. Go on, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Don't be so modest. Um, of course, none of this happens without the cash, right? Um, without funding, national strategies are little more than pieces of well-meaning paper, or pieces of paper with well-meaning um, words written on them. 
When I was appointed a few years ago, I asked for all of the national strategies to be brought to my office in the Department of Health. And to this day, they are on a, there, is a, there is a shelf in the department and it has all of the, um, all of the strategies, the maternity strategy, trauma strategy, and the previous mental health strategy. We then launched the, the new one, the cancer strategy, the list goes on. The second thing I asked for was the amount of money that had been allocated over the last few years per strategy. And that was where the insight was. There were, there were and are many very well thought through, very well crafted um, strategies, but they weren't getting the money. The National Cancer Strategy needed about 20 million euro a year. I think it was getting about one or two million. The Maternity Strategy needed about eight million a year. I think it was getting about 800,000 euro. The National Ambulance Strategy, the list goes on. And so one of the things that um, I committed this government to was to funding the clinical strategies. It doesn't mean that they can all get all the money they need every year. We don't actually have enough new development funding to do that with everything every year. But what I wanted to see was a complete step change in our funding of national strategies. Previously, there had been a lot of funding going into, uh, be it beds or workforce in certain areas, but what wasn't happening was the strategies weren't getting the money uh, that they needed, and we weren't seeing the kind of progress in terms of the quality of services, the breadth of services, the depth of services we really uh, needed to see. And I'm delighted to say uh, that we have held true to that in mental health as well. The budget for 2020 was 970 million euro. Now that's a lot of money. It's not to say that a lot wasn't done previous to this government, a lot was done previously, and a lot of good work, a lot of investment, uh, a lot of important things happened before this government ever came in. However, the budget has now increased from 970 million to 1.3 billion euro. That's a 330 million euro increase. It's, it's an increase in one government, and we're still here, it's an increase in, in one government, the mental health budget, of more than one third. That's our commitment. Mary Butler fought very hard for that money. I fought very hard for that money. And I have to say, we got very, very strong support. We got support from government. We got support from, uh, uh, from, the, from the two finance ministers right through as well. And because of that increase, we've been able to hire now 12,300 people, or whole time equivalents. And we've got about another, I think it's 108 million uh, going out, essential money going out to uh, the voluntary sector as well, to the NGO. Uh, sector as well. So what of this year? Uh, you may have read that there were some differences of opinion between the Department of Health and the Department of Money. Um, uh, we fought very hard and we still got a, a very sizable budget. Obviously we will always look for more. But one of the areas where Mary and I said the embargo for example would not apply to and we would continue with the new development funding uh, was in mental health services, particularly in youth mental health services. And I believe we have another 68 uh, full-time posts sanctioned through the budget. And then uh, I know Minister Butler was announcing this morning that on top of that, we fought very hard again to get more new development funding. We got an amount of money at the end of December. And as uh, Mary announced this morning, we are allocating a full 10 million euro in recurrent funding into youth mental health. That'll both be CAMs and, and, you know, and, and non-CAM services, um, but it's gonna make a big difference and it's gonna allow us to continue to roll out and fully staff up these teams, these CAMs teams, youth mental health teams, um, uh, right across the country. But as you all know, Money, whilst essential, isn't enough. The way that the philosophy we've been taking over the last three to four years is capacity and reform. We're applying it in the waiting lists. We're applying it in community services. We're applying it to the trolleys. So when I was appointed, the healthcare workers quite rightly said to me, we need more capacity. We need more psychiatrists, we need more health and social care professionals, we need more psychologists, 
We need more college places, we need more training places. We need more acute beds, mental health beds, non-mental health beds. We need more community facilities. We need more funding to uh, the voluntary sector, to the NGO sector. We need more healthcare assets to meet the demand. And I said, fine, I agree. And government said fine, and we agreed. And that's why we've seen this very, very significant increase in funding. But what I've said back to the healthcare service is, we also need reform. You can see it, for example, in uh, the trolleys. There are hospitals with similar level of assets and similar levels of demand, which have completely different outcomes in terms of the number of patients who are waiting for trolleys. We know that's the case everywhere. We know it's the case in mental health. We know it's the case uh, in the acute services. We know it's the case right across the board. And that's why I was really glad to see two, uh, uh, two key appointments. A national assistant director on the operational side in youth mental health and a clinical lead. Uh, and I was delighted to see that Donan and, and uh, Amanda have taken up those posts and we've now set up the national office. So this office, um, Amanda and Donan and Mary and myself and the department officials and all of those working across the service, we need to use this as a moment in time to say, look, we need to be honest with ourselves. Some things are working very well. Some things are not working very well. Some teams are high performing teams where there's, there's very good interactions between acute services and community services and it's working. There are other teams where those relationships simply are not in a good place and the acute community relationships are not where they need to be. There are some teams where the level of productivity is very high, where the number of people being treated and receiving care, be it outpatient appointments or therapy sessions or acute sessions or whatever it is, where the amount of care being provided for the amount of healthcare resources is very high. There are other areas where it just isn't that high, right? And this is, this is, this is right across the health service. This isn't just mental health or youth mental health or anything else. It's right across the health services. So the good news is we have the pieces in place now to provide the services we all want to provide and that are envisioned in the national strategy. The capacity has grown very, very substantially. It's going to continue to grow. We have really serious national leaders now, both at an operational level and a clinical level, who are going to help drive that reform. I think Minister Butler and I are meeting with Amanda and Donan tomorrow morning, actually, to talk about the 10 million euro. And what are we going to do? How are we going to invest that money, be it in ICT systems, which I know are woefully unfit for purpose when it comes to mental health services, uh, as well as other, um, as well as other uh, things as well. So that's the, that's the one ask of me back to all of you is, and I know you will, is to embrace that reform. And let's, let's, spread the things that we know work, the practices we know work, the good relationships, the multidisciplinary approaches. Let's make sure that we start seeing that consistently around the country. And I am absolutely convinced that all of you will evolve and grow and modernize our service to a point where the, the time people have to wait, be they adults, children, adolescents, the time people have to wait goes down and down and down till we get to uh, the kind of service levels that we absolutely uh, want to see. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the opportunity as well to shamelessly plug uh, or bang a drum uh, that I've been banging for quite some time around one particular aspect of prevention, and it's social media and mobile phones. Obviously, there are many, many determinants of mental health, um, but one that really concerns me, the mounting evidence from around the world is shocking in terms of the direct links and without any shadow of a doubt causal uh, relationships between the amount of time young people are spending on mobile phones, the amount of time they're spending on social media, what I view, is, uh, what I view as deeply sinister content which is actively and knowingly promoted um, by some of these platforms, it is having a, an awful effect, impact uh, on youth mental health, right up to the most severe issues, right up to body dysmorphia and eating disorders and suicide ideation um, and suicide. I've spoken to fathers and mothers who have lost their children to suicide, 
Um, and when you say to them what happened, a lot of the time, the first thing they do is hold up their phone and say, this, this happened. Um, at the BT Young Scientist, there was one uh, brilliant uh, young man who was, who was trying to come up with an app that would begin to filter out some of the harm, harmful content. He was looking at um, TikTok, and he said it took 45 seconds. So he created profiles, or a profile, and he, 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 he had, the, had the app. He said it took about 45 seconds to go from very innocuous content to, uh, and he showed it to me, clear, unambiguous promotion of body dysmorphia and all sorts of other stuff, just through a few likes. The evidence is, um, the evidence is mounting. Um, we have a mobile phone voluntary code in Greystones, which, were, which is, seems to be spreading right across the country. Um, we have a new online safety commissioner who is phenomenal. Uh, and we're going to be bringing in, and they're going to be leading on a, a, a binding code now for, for, uh, for, the, for, um, for the platforms. But it's certainly something that I want to see in terms of, um, in terms of protecting young people. I think in years to come, people will look back uh, in this, at the same way they, they, we look now at cigarettes, uh, in terms of the harm and the lack of regulation and the, uh, and, and the lack of protections. That said, um, I, I don't want to be down on, on, on all digital, obviously. There are some very important things happening in terms of uh, digital services uh, as well. I think the My Mental Health Plan app is um, it's great to see. It's great to see this kind of, uh, this kind of development. As well, the online uh, CBT service. I think is very interesting. I think these are exactly the kind of forces for good that the phones or uh, or, uh, or or digital healthcare can um, can have. And I know that the HSE's digital uh, the digital front door project, I think, is very interesting. Uh, very interested to see where that goes in terms of meeting a lot of young people where they are, which is you know which is online, which is digital natives. Um, so it, it's. Uh, it's not obviously that I, I, I'm down on all digital, uh, and, uh, but, but there, there are dangers and there's some great opportunities. So fair play to everyone who's working on the, on the, um, the platforms and on the apps. It's, uh, it's great to see. Um, we need a lot of research as well. Uh, critical that Ireland has our own research uh, and that we're seen as world leaders in terms of mental health research. You'll be aware the Health Research Board recently announced a new program with a five million euro fund in terms of mental health research. We want to make sure that that our policy is informed by very forward-thinking, um, evidence-based mental health research. And I am very much looking forward to seeing the kind of insights that is going to come out of this funding, come out of this work, uh, and probably shape the next sharing the vision, whatever, uh, whatever, that, um, whatever that might be. Uh, finally, um, we want to get the mental health bill before the Oireachtas as early as possible this year. It's been a long-standing commitment. Um, it is a vast amount of work. It is badly needed. There needs to be a modern legislative and regulatory underpinning to all of the good work uh, that you all do. And, and it's something that, um, that Dr. Burke and I have already discussed in terms of regs and legislation that can support all of, all of the good work. So I'm going to finish there. I just want to, I want to finish again by just acknowledging all of the work that you do. Um, it, is, it is a privilege for us to work in healthcare. It is, a, it is an amazing privilege to get up in the morning and for our jobs to be to try and make things better for people. But it is hard. The work you all do is tough. The daily pressures you are, are under are tough. Um, it is hard on a human level. Um, dealing with ch children, adolescents, adults who are suffering sometimes in mild ways, sometimes in very serious ways, being the person who supports them or a member of the team who supports them through sometimes very difficult times, sometimes very dark times, it's not easy. It does take a toll, uh, whether or not it is, uh, it is rewarding. So I just want to acknowledge that. I think you all do a phenomenal job. Uh, it, is, it is such important work. It's why government is backing what you do so much. It's why we've increased the funding by hundreds of millions of euro just over the last a uh, few budgets, and it's why the mental health services, our mental health community uh, of providers, why we will continue to make sure that the resources available to you expand, that the modernization expand, that the reforms are put in place to support you uh, in everything that you do as we progress 
to our ultimate goal of universal health care, very simply that everyone can get the care they need uh, when they need it. So for everything you've done over the last few years, for everything you will be doing and you're committing yourselves to doing in the future under the national strategy and in your day-to-day -day services, thank you all so much. Okay, great stuff. Thank you uh, so much to the Minister. Um, stirring words and I think great appreciation for all of the excellent work that you all do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So thank you so much to him for, for being with us. I'm going to move us along now to our second uh, keynote speaker uh, of the afternoon. And um, uh, in some ways, you know, a lot of the conversations we've been having earlier on are about, you know, thank you, there's more money, how do we spend the money? But, you know, I think it's really interesting to hear someone of the calibre of Associate Professor uh, David McDade, uh, who talks about, you know, the importance of investment, not cost, as a lens for looking at spending uh, in uh, this area. So um, I'm really delighted uh, to welcome him, Research Fellow in Health Policy and Health Economics, at the Care Policy and Evaluation Center at the LSE. Um, uh, he's going to focus on the economic case uh, for uh, investment. And the primary focus of his work is on economic arguments to support investment in mental health, wellbeing promotion, self-harm, suicide, and mental illness prevention within and beyond uh, the health sector. So you are very welcome. By the way, Gronny, how, how long do I have now? Do I have to, because I'm concerned about the coffee breaks and things like that. I'm okay. I'm not gonna have to <coughs> oh, oh. That's, blame it on Gronia, not on me. There you've heard it from her. Um, okay, so good afternoon uh, to everyone. And first of all, I'd like to thank the department, uh, the HSE, uh, and everyone here for, uh, well, first of all, the, the department, the HSE, for the inv invitation, and everyone here for coming along to hear someone witter on about money and costs and economics this afternoon, especially after a nice lunch, so I know that's always a, a challenge. Um, I did want to, I was trying to think, uh, when Lydia was speaking this morning, she was talking about the contribution that Ireland had made to the development of uh, mental, health, mental health practice and policy in Albania through Irish aid. And I couldn't come up with something similar, but I can say that I wouldn't be here at all if it wasn't for a collaboration between the counties of Clare and County Donegal, which ultimately has led to me being here today. So, 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 so th there's an Irish contribution there. So, Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about the case for investment. And actually, the other thing I do want to say first, uh, how unusual I find it to see a conference actually where two ministers talk in person in a day, and actually one minister has been here the entire conference so far, so which it doesn't always happen like this, so, so I, I think that should be noted. Anyway, now I'm going to talk about the dry and boring stuff about money, but I, I do want to first of all say, before you start thinking, oh my God, he's a money man and that's all he's interested in, everything I'm trying to say here in the next few minutes is about trying to add an extra argument to the profound moral and human issue about it, uh, supporting mental health, protecting our mental health, aiding and recovery when our mental health uh, is in distress. Um, and that almost must be remembered. There's a moral case for investing in mental health, but the money arguments can help, and there are many ways in which they can help. So I do want to start by just emphasising this point. And I know probably everyone in the room knows this, but there is really substantial evidence on the long-term and profound impacts of poor mental health. And I won't witter on long about this, but it is worth noting, if you can see in this slide, this is the global burden, burden disease data for, for Ireland. And you will notice that in terms of years lived with poor health, years lived with disability, as, the, uh, as this study looks, uh, mentions, you'll see that four of the top conditions are mental health conditions, including anxiety and depression, alcohol-related problems, and schizophrenia, 
right down the bottom as well. These are the classifications that the, G, uh, that the Global Burden Disease Study use. So it's a really important issue in an Irish context, and these figures are no different to, to what you'd see in Western Europe uh, generally. High uh, contributions to burden of disease. And of course, as well as that, we have the issue of self-harm and suicide, where, again, Ireland is not unusual in having uh, self-harm and suicide as the leading cause of um, uh, disability-adjusted life years. That, that's years lost of life, as well as years lived with poor life uh, for, for young people between the ages of 15 and 49. So we must never forget that. I mean, the, these are, the, that's one justification for thinking about mental health. It really is a profound and important uh, contributor, if that's the right word, to the overall burden of poor health uh, in the country and indeed in Europe. And it was good as well to hear this morning about the, the focus on youth mental health and indeed the entire life course, but on youth mental health as well, because it is also the case that most mental health problems have their onset in the teenage years up to uh, early adulthood, uh, maybe two thirds by the age of 25. That's not to say we should not be thinking about other age groups as well, but it does mean there's an important opportunity to think about how we can protect and promote the mental health and well-being of young people uh, everywhere, including in, in Ireland. Um, so it's really, really important we think about that because this is also about life chances. Uh, if you have poor mental health in childhood, it really does potentially have a long-term adverse impact across your, your life. Uh, and again, this is stuff that you'll all know, but I'm still going to say it because I think it's really important to mention these things. Poor mental health in adolescence can be associated with poor educational outcomes. And that, in turn, is associated with uh, impacts on employment and career opportunities, life chances. There are impacts on physical health. I'll come back to that impacts related to substances, substance misuse. There are many people, at least in England, in the criminal justice system who are there, in my view, because they have mental health problems. You know, there's a high proportion of people within the criminal justice system who really shouldn't be there. Uh, they should be treated, at, or they should be supported outside of the criminal justice system. And we have in, in issues of su suicide we've mentioned and well-being as well. So there's lots and lots and lots of reasons why it's a profoundly important issue to think about. But there are also money arguments. Now, I'm not going to show figures from uh, Ireland, but I am going to show some recent work that we did in the UK uh, with uh, an organisation called the Mental Health Foundation, where we estimated the overall impacts uh, to the economy of poor mental health uh, in 2020, I think it was, or 21, doesn't matter. Um, and what we find there, I mean, these are big numbers. Hundreds of thousands of millions of pounds, pound and a euro, pretty much the same these days, so you can pretty much swap one for the other. Um, but what, it's a huge contribution or lack of, uh, it's, it's a loss to the economy. It's 5% of all growth, economic productivity in the economy is lost because of poor mental health. And that's not just about the person themselves who may be living with poor mental health conditions. It's about impacts on families as well. It's about lost opportunities for work, the lost educational opportunities. Um, these are substantial impacts. So when anyone says, you know, well, we need arguments for investing more in mental health, we can point to the substantial consequences of not taking action. Um, and you can see, um, if you look at the, the, the north of Ireland there, 3.4 billion pounds there in terms of costs. Uh, you know, a, a, as, a, a, as one example, really substantial costs and much of that, not all, but much of it um, may be uh, 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 avoidable through earlier intervention, prevention, promotion and more investment in recovery. This is another slide from the same study. And I'm sorry, I'm going to, this is death by PowerPoint, loads and loads of slides. But, but the point here I want to emphasise is that the big contributors to overall cost um, in, in any Western European country are conditions such as depression, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, as well as the, the severe conditions such as psychoses and eating disorders and suicide and self-harm. But sometimes I feel, and it's a personal reflection, that we don't put enough attention on some of these conditions such as anxiety uh, in, in, in the past. It doesn't happen as much. It tends to get overlooked as being less of an important issue, but it does have a substantial impact. And it does also, uh, it's often 
comorbid, or it's, it's often you've often said also with other mental health conditions. So one thing I would suggest is perhaps to think even more about conditions such as anxiety in going forward. And I know you are doing that in uh, shaping the vision in Ireland. And then the other thing I want to say, and I was talking to Lydia before she left uh, about the point that I always find extraordinary that. Um, Whenever you go to a conference on mental health or people talk about mental health, they rarely mention the lost life expectancy of people living with mental health conditions. Um, now, I don't know the figures in Ireland, but I can tell you the figures in the Nordic countries, in Norway, in Denmark and Finland. Okay? Also, no, Norway, Sweden and Denmark. Get it right. Right countries. Um, but the point is, there's a 20-year difference in life expectancy for people living with poor, chronic mental health conditions compared to the general population, 20 years. If we were talking about cancer, cardiovascular disease, we'd be shouting it from the rooftops all the time. But I don't know why, it doesn't seem to get talked about as much. And this is not through uh, morbidity or mortality due to suicide. This is about excess risk, higher chances of having diabetes, having cardiovascular disease, having poorer management of physical health conditions when you get them because of living with mental health conditions as well. So I think that's another issue never to overlook, that by improving what we do in terms of mental health, we're going to have benefits for physical health, and we are dealing with this profound inequality in life expectancy. And as I say, I mentioned the Nordic countries, they are not poor countries, they have excellent welfare systems, excellent social welfare safety nets, but there still is this gap, okay? So it's not just about poverty and so forth. It is about other factors as well. And you don't need to worry, you don't need to worry about these busy, this busy slide, but basically this is saying for virtually every way in which you think about health service use, people who are living with a mental health condition will have higher use of... Uh, when it comes to their physical care, they will high, have higher use of primary care, higher contacts with A&E departments, higher use of inpatient care, excess costs compared to the general population. Uh, and, and again, these costs, potentially, some of them can be avoided through better management of physical health of people living with mental health conditions. And I don't want to, I don't want to labour the point, but it's an important point not to overlook. And then the final thing I want to say about impacts and it's not something I'll come back to later on, but I will mention it. It's work that we did with Youth For Me uh, um, a couple of years ago now, where we looked at the impacts on carers, families living uh, or supporting a loved one with a range of mental health conditions. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of love, a lot of support. And I think that gets overlooked sometimes as well, the value of caring and the value of support that families give. We estimated through a survey of more than 700 people, including many in the UK and Ireland, that's around 43 hours a week of care that people are providing. And many of those people are working as well, you know. And, and I think there is an issue as well about protecting the mental and physical health of carers of all sorts as well. We often think about dementia and protecting carers of, of people living with dementia, but I think that applies. This, this is not a study of people with dementia. It's, it's all sorts of mental health conditions. And I think that that's another thing not to overlook, uh, supporting the carers, supporting people that can also... Um, help with the, with that with um, help provide love and support to family members and others okay so so i've really tried to say very quickly things you probably already know but really there is a strong argument for taking action it costs a lot profound impacts life expectancy poor health uh, poor life chances loads and loads and loads of things well where does economics fit into this well really we're about trying to say a few things, um, hopefully in a way that's understandable. One, we want to identify, well, are there costs of doing nothing? Okay, and we've already seen for that big slide on the costs in the UK of mental health problems, there are costs of not taking action or not taking enough action. This is not a cost-free area. Uh, what, uh, we also, though, do need to know how we spend our budgets, the costs of action. So we've heard from uh, both ministers today, actually, about the importance of spending our resources wisely. The, the existing resources we have. So it's really important to know how we're using our resources, what resources we have. Could we use them in different ways that are more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at that. We're also then looking at that alongside effectiveness evidence. Do things actually work? No point investing in things that don't work. Um, you might say that's an absolutely obvious thing to say, but it happens a lot. In all sorts of places, money gets invested in things that perhaps it shouldn't be. And we also need to think about the issues of how we scale up effective interventions. So again, we heard this morning about um, 
about the importance of the workforce and having the right workforce and, and the right skills and mix and all the rest of it. And that's really critically important if we want things to actually work, for implementation to work. No good just proving they work in pilot projects, as has been mentioned, but how do you scale that up? Okay. So, they are, so, so that's, that's the second thing. So they are some of the economic questions. And I want to say a little bit now about what are some of the... Um, what are, what, what are some of the economic arguments? How, where can we see that there is a strong case for taking action? And I should start by saying, I'm not showing these examples because they're the best things or, or, or whatever. I'm just showing some illustrative examples, partly because they're actually some things that I've been involved with, so I know a bit more about them. Uh, and also, some of them do, I think, fit in with uh, shaping the vision uh, in terms of uh, the focus you have on early intervention and prevention, uh, and actions across the live course. But I'm not trying to say that these are the best things to do, but these are things that are effective and they're cost effective. And I want to start off actually first by talking about well-being. And this is not specifically about an intervention, but um, again, it, within, the, within this room, I mean, I can, some people so sometimes say, well, well-being is a bit airy-fairy, you know, it doesn't really mean very much, okay? Um, well, that's absolute nonsense because it's possible to test and show that better mental well-being uh, is protective to our mental health and it has an impact for the economy. And, and I show um, an example from Denmark where we were able, well, colleagues Ziggy Santini and colleagues including me, uh, were able to look at this and we were able to identify people in Denmark with good well-being and then we follow them over time and see what impact it has in terms of their, their mental health and their costs to the welfare system in Denmark. And what we find essentially is that well-being is protective. It's associated with lower, if you've got better mental well-being, you're less likely to have mental health care costs at a future point in time. You're also less likely to be claiming sickness benefits, okay? So, now, there are lots of things you can do to, to promote well-being. I like doing park runs, and there's loads of park runs in Dublin. That's not for everyone. But the point is there's lots of things to think there about well-being and how to promote that. It's not airy-fairy. It, it does make a difference, and there are robust studies more and more coming out now, particularly from the Nordic countries that show that this is the case, where they've got electronic records and large data systems. So, again, that's a good thing you're doing more of that in Ireland as well. There's lots about prevention of mental illness, and I can't go through everything in, in the short time I've got today. But, um, the, the, I mean, I wrote a paper a couple of, well, three or four years ago now, reviewing the evidence then, and the evidence has exploded en enormously since we wrote that paper. Um, evidence on prevention across the life course, um, and to give some examples here, um, we're talking about solutions for all of society, some which are much more actually for the Minister of Finance, maybe about social welfare, safety protection. I think the, um, what we call the furlough scheme in England during the COVID pandemic, I think that was really quite important for protecting some people's mental health, that financial security. Um, but it's also about um, uh, primary prevention. It's about interventions uh, in, in settings such as schools and workplaces. It's about interventions across the life course. And as I say, I'm not going to go into all of those in detail now, but some examples that there's good evidence on their effectiveness and cost effectiveness include various interventions to, to prevent and tackle perinatal depression, uh, health visitor programs, parenting programs. There's evidence, including from Ireland, on the effectiveness that different parenting programs can have um, in terms of the pr promoting the mental health of young people, uh, anti-bullying programs, exercise. These are just some of the examples out there. We did some work uh, in England for a, a public health thing, our public health agency, as it was at the time. We were asked to look at, well, what works in terms of uh, cost-effective mental health promotion and prevention interventions. We worked with civil servants to identify a number of key interventions which were both practical uh, and where there was evidence on effect. And we produced a little tool for the, uh, for the, for the, um, for the government uh, uh, showing what the evidence was. And without dwelling too much on this, I just want to show you here, we try to present things in terms of what we call the economic payoff, return on investment. For every pound or euro you spend, how many euros will you get back as an economy? And in all of these cases, we find that there's a positive return on investment from investing in anti-bullying programs in schools, from tackling some aspects of depression, 
investing in workplace uh, well-being, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lots of things down there, including there's one called uh, for, about loneliness alleviation that I'll come back to in a second. But the point here was trying to identify which sector pays, which sectors benefit, how long does it take? Because those arguments can often be helpful when you're talking to people who may not necessarily be fully paid up members of the Let's Invest in Mental Health Society. So having these things is important. And you'll notice suicide prevention has a very big number at the bottom. And that's because, despite what I said earlier, you know, the, the, the key thing there is the loss of life from suicide and, and the economic cost of a lost life uh, is really substantial. So anything we can do to prevent suicide, um, well, uh, it can really make a difference. So there's large payoffs there from interventions. I just wanted to mention the loneliness one very quickly. Um, this is an update to what we did for the, for the government in 2017. We broadened what we did. Every, back The first one we did, it was about £1.20 for every pound you spent uh, in benefits for tackling loneliness in older people. But then we expanded what we were looking at, and we looked not only at impacts on mental health, but also on physical health. Impacts in terms of reduction of the risk of strokes, of cardiovascular disease, the, the reduction of the likelihood of um, being admitted into residential care. My point here is not to talk so much about loneliness. The point is that it's possible when we think about making the case for mental health and investing in mental health not to overlook the additional benefits as well in terms of physical health, improvements, impacts on families, etc., etc. And this is a nice example where the return on investment increases uh, you know, threefold by thinking about these other impacts. Well, we've got reasonable evidence that there's an association between loneliness and these adverse outcomes, and we know about interventions now that can tackle loneliness. So that's a little bit about prevention. What about treatments? And again, there's a huge number of treatments, and there's no way that I can talk about all of those here now. But what I can point you to is some work that we've done with an organisation called Mental Health Europe, an NGO umbrella body across Europe. And we did a review for them um, very recently on uh, the value of money, uh, the value for money of investing in community mental health intervention. So not focusing on drugs. There's nothing on drugs in what I'm going to show you. But we looked at what, what is known from reviewing loads and loads of studies about the economic case for various interventions. And I hope this is not too small to see. But th there's a point here. There's lots of things where we found evidence that they're effective and cost effective, OK? And, and I think I, the, the point I would really make is the, the, the negative column where we, where we find studies that show that it's not worth doing we don't find very many. Now, that may be a publication bias. Maybe people don't publish things where they don't work. But I think it's very encouraging that we see very high rates of studies that are published that indicate there's a, an argument both for effectiveness and cost effectiveness, a whole range of different interventions, many of which are considered in shaping the vision. Uh, and, and I just emphasise down the bottom things like digital therapies, uh, digital offers, and psychological therapies as well. Lots of evidence on those. They don't all work. Um, but many do, and, uh, and I think they're a great thing to think about. Um, again, very tiny, quick examples, and again, I don't want the death by a thousand slides, but the point, the point here is the red boxes in the south, southeast quadrant. Um, basically, that means an intervention, when you, when you compare it against something else, it costs less and it's more effective. And the, lots of the dots are basically showing what's likely to happen, where, what's more likely to be seen when you when you do complicated statistical analysis and, uh, and when you're evaluating interventions. And what we find, and th this, is, this is common to many psychological interventions, not all, but many, is that things, for instance, such as brief therapy for, for young people to tackle anxiety and depression can be both more effective and less costly. Of course, it's about the way it's implemented and the context is very important, but it can be more effective and more cost, uh, less costly. You can have very brief therapies that do the same thing as well. There's a, an example here from the UK of a one-session therapy for phobia, which actually turns out to be less costly, well, that's not surprising, I suppose, but more effective than, than multiple-session therapy for the same thing. So, again, very brief therapies have a place to play, a role to play as well. And then there's the, I think somebody mentioned uh, in one of the previous sessions about the importance of psychological offers for people with physical health problems, such as oncology. That also applies for things like diabetes. Lots of complications of diabetes associated with, uh, with people living with depression or poor mental health more likely to have complications. But very few people, in England at least, having access to psychological support to manage their mental health when they're being treated for diabetes. And that, that's a, another potential win-win as well. 
I've got to be quick, I know, but I can't, I can't not talk about early intervention. Uh, and I just want to mention a couple of things very quickly because I know you have a number of early intervention initiatives going on through Shaping the Vision. And the first thing I'd like to do is present some, uh, highlight some work uh, from, from Ireland, from Caribbean, and from Brendan Kennelly, who's uh, in the audience, um, looking at the economic case for investing in early intervention for psychosis services in an Irish context, in a real-world setting, comparing parts of Ireland where these teams existed with, with areas of Ireland where they didn't. Um, and basically, again, coming back to those funny kind of graphs I showed you earlier, this southeast quadrant, um, you're finding lots of examples here. Well, most of the time, in the analysis that Brendan and Cara and others did, you find that early intervention teams compared to standard community mental health teams and assertive out outreach teams were found to be more effective and less costly. Okay? And that's looking at over a one-year time period in terms of impacts both to health service utilisation and wider impacts as well, families and carers, and families and employment and so forth as well. So a much higher chance of having better outcomes and lower costs. And I won't dwell on this slide. It's, the, it's a similar study in England, but it's basically saying the same thing. This was over three years. Early people receiving early intervention teams uh, are much more likely to have lower health system costs because they're less likely to have to go into inpatient care. Um, and overall, there are broader benefits because once you factor in things such as uh, accommodation, employment, housing, etc., that there are broad benefits that go beyond the health system. So, again, that's just one example there. For self-harm and suicide, uh, I'll show you one example, and again with these funny pictures in a second. Simply improving gui uh, adherence to existing guidance can make a difference. In England, our National Institute for Clinical Excellence recommends psychosocial assessments every, every time someone turns up at the hospital emergency department with potential uh, uh, self-harm. Um, but it doesn't happen. It's about 50% of the time it actually happens, these psychosocial assessments. We did some modelling work using real data from, uh, from Oxford, basically saying that um, there's an economic case. You know, if you simply can persuade more clinicians, more staff in a hospital setting to adhere to the existing guidelines about doing the psychosocial assessments, there are potential benefits about that, from that, potentially because it's a therapeutic benefit of the conversation itself uh, uh, about, um, about self-harm in, in that environment. So simple interventions, high chance of being cost-effective, the green dots in, a, in an English context. Eating disorders is an area we don't talk about enough, I think, and I've hardly done any work on eating disorders, but I've been involved in something recently. And again, this is a complicated slide, but the point of this slide is basically it's comparing five different ways in which to support people with eating disorders. And the one with the lowest costs and the best quality of life outcomes is the one which combines reduce, reduction of waiting times to get access to care and support, because waiting times can be high to access eating disorder services, certainly in the countries we looked at in England, Germany and Spain, um, and also having better access to specialist care. Okay, specialist eating disorder care is really important, and there's a strong economic case for doing this. As I say, I don't know it in Ireland, but certainly I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be the case here as well. So early intervention, um, reduce, reduce, re reduction of time to access services, and ideally access to specialist services for that condition, for those conditions, anorexia uh, is very important. And, and very quickly, um, I, I wanted to say something about the case beyond the health system. And, and again, there have been lots of points made this morning about, um, I think it was the T-Shop who talked about a whole of government approaches has been necessary. And that really is important. And I just want to give one example. I could have talked about supported housing. There are housing first initiatives here in Ireland, I understand, and housing first, you know, getting people into their own homes and supporting them. That's a potentially interesting route to go down. Supported education to help people complete their education, to stay in university, et cetera, et cetera, really important. I just want to go show one example, which is about supported employment, about helping people who want to work uh, actually have the opportunity to get into work or to stay in work um, as part of the recovery process. This is often for young people, but it's for people of all ages. And it's about getting people real jobs, that, that ideally that things that they want to do, earning real wages. So that's what I'm talking about, not, not sheltered work. Although the, the, there is a role for sheltered work for, for particular groups as well. But the point is here is that this requires a partnership between health, 
between education because of the transition from schools to work and with the Department of, uh, well, uh, Department of Social Protection or whatever the Department of Work is in Ireland. In, in England, it would be the Department of Work and Pensions who work hand in hand with the Department of Health. And there's a lot of evidence now that these programmes are cost effective, they save money. Uh, often that saving is not necessary to the health system, it can be to the, uh, the, the, the welfare system, let's say or to, 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 to employers uh, who benefit from this. But there are health benefits as well. Um, but it also means, again, when we're making arguments, we're making arguments within the health system, but we're also sometimes having to say the benefits, the costs may be incurred in the health system, but the benefits will actually be to other parts of the economy, which is why a whole-of-government approach where you get the Minister of Finance signed up that's, to, to recognise, and this is really important as well. And, and these impacts can be sustained over time. There's a Swiss study... Basically, people who got into the support of the, uh, had help getting into work, stayed in work uh, over many years. And, and I'll just end uh, in terms of this, and then, then I am almost done, um, with one example from Norway that's just come out very recently. And the point there is that the welfare benefit system in, in Norway is very good. So you might think people don't have the strong incentive to go into work. But you find that supported employment programs work there as well because people want, well, not everyone, but many people want support and employment as part of the recovery process. So you get more people into work, staying in work for longer, and it also has positive impacts on their, on their well-being as well. And those impacts get stronger over time. So my final slide. <laughs> it is my final slide. Um, um, but, I, but I blame the minister for being late. I mean, that's the, that's the whole reason. <laughs> so, sorry. Sorry. I, I, anyway, but I, I just want to say, basically, there is a moral argument for taking action. There really is, but there are substantial and avoidable costs of poor mental health, and the point is they are avoidable through effective interventions. So don't be coy or, or embarrassed about making those money arguments alongside the, the, the arguments that you want to make, many of you want to make about the profound value of investing in mental health. There are lots of cost-effective interventions out there. Some will be very suited to Ireland, some will be less suited. Um, I agree with the point that John was making about pilots, um, if, there's good inter if there's good evidence that things work in, in, in many parts of Western Europe, they probably will work in Ireland as well. There's th still things to test out, but, but, but uh, you know, that, that's, that's important. Whole systems are incredibly important. Don't overlook the primary and voluntary sector, which is very important in Ireland. Early intervention really makes a difference and facilitate more action outside of health systems. And just one final thing to say, one final thing, is that um, uh, one thing we're trying to do now, I'm working with mental health reform in Ireland on some work, which hopefully will try and strengthen what we know about the value of investing in different interventions and different supports to promote uh, the, the, the mental health of young people. Hopefully there, um, that's looking at international experience as well, and hopefully that work will be coming out later on this year. So that will be extra context and hopefully stuff to, to feed into shaping the vision for years to come. So... Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I know we're running a little behind time, but uh, that's okay. We're resting on our lunch. Um, questions, comments on what you've heard, the cost. Are you convinced? Are there any spanners you can see in <laughs> what's been presented today? Yes, please. Uh, let me get a microphone to you. I think it makes really good sense in what you're saying there because I work with the traveller community and they're financially excluded because of barriers to employment mm -hmm. and they're considered old at the age of 36 compared to the wider population. So what you're saying makes really good sense. And... Uh what I would say to that as well, it's really important that when we're thinking about making the economic case for the traveller community, that we're working with the traveller community and understanding all of these issues in detail because that's another really important point about bringing people with lived experience into economics as well and economic arguments. Great. Yes, there's uh, two quick ones. Yeah, microphone's coming down to you now. Thank you. Yeah, just at your left and beyond yeah. again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Margot Wrigley. I'm the clinical lead for the adult ADHD National Clinical Programme. Um, and uh, I found your uh, talk fascinating. And uh, could I, I would like just to say that in terms of making an argument, I was previously working in perinatal mental health. And uh, we quoted in our model of care a LSE paper 
um, which said that um, without intervention, um, poor mental health in pregnancy costs 10,000 yeah. pounds per baby, and to rectify the matter was 600 pounds per baby. Um, and that was a very strong argument we had in that. So really, my comment is more a plea. Could you look at ADHD in adults <laughs> for us and, and give us those very nice, useful figures that people will easily understand uh, cause benefit if you, if you provide intervention? Thank I'll you. I'll do my best. Well done. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. And the last one just behind you there, yeah. Hi. Yes, uh, Fiona Kyo. I'm, I'm chairing the group developing the uh, Mental Health Research Strategy, uh, Recommendation 93 in the policy. Um, I, thanks very much for that very illuminating uh, talk, David. I'm just wondering the importance of the whole of government approach, mm. in particular in relation to mental health, compared to lots of other conditions where um, lots of other areas of life both impact and can be impacted on by a, a mental health difficulty. Are there any other jurisdictions that have really cracked the, the whole of government challenge or are doing it well? <laughs> um, I don't think anyone's cracked it perfectly, but actually this is one time that I'll actually say there are some positive developments in England, actually, because what has started to happen more is that uh, when public policies have been developed in England, a mental health impact assessment is also taking place. So it's looking at the potential unintended consequences for mental health of policy, of, 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 of the policy. And it's also looking the other way around at uh, what happens in terms of mental, mental health and its impacts beyond health system and beyond mental health as well. So I do think that kind of exercise doesn't cost a lot of money to actually say, okay, as part of public policy development, think about a health impact assessment or, uh, and or think about a mental health impact assessment and see what value that has. And, and that can then inform policy uh, in a sense. And the other thing I would say very quickly, very, very quickly, is about um, thinking about innovative, way, innovative ways, and the Nordic countries are very good at this, or some of them are, um, about sharing budgets for specific activities. So you take away this whole issue about one sector benefits and one sector pays, and that has happened with supported employment to some extent. There have been shared budgets in Norway for, um, for, and Sweden, actually, uh, for, um, for, for these employment services, and that can make a difference. So there's practical things that don't cost a lot of money. They're just about regulatory frameworks. Uh, can make a difference. But I do think the impact assessments are useful to do as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, uh, really interesting um, uh, presentation and raising some of those issues around you know, is it how we put things, is it what we value, but certainly being able to look at that economic lens uh, as a really uh, strong way of making um, a case. So I'm going to move on quickly with your permission. Our next session is looking at digital mental health, um, and I'm really pleased that Emer Clark is joining us this afternoon, and Emer is the Senior Project Manager with Mental Health Operations in the HSE. She joined the mental health team back in 2016 uh, uh, as a lead for communications. She works across a range of areas within mental health and sharing the vision policy, including digital mental health. And she's also mental health operations lead on Connecting for Life. Emer, you're very welcome. Good afternoon. I was going to introduce myself, but now I don't have to. So um, the good news is that um, I have somebody helping me down the back with this presentation because the bad news is I forgot my glasses. And this is the day I've realized that I need to bring them to events like this. So um, I'm going to take you through some of our recent digital mental health updates in relation to sharing the vision. So after the, uh, the last number of years, digital has been playing a really important role in the provision of uh, digital mental health supports. So the key aim for sharing the vision is, as has been mentioned, is to provide mental health support for the whole of the population. And digital is really a key way, a key enabler for us to do that. So they can be accessed in a timely fashion, which naturally can impact on waiting lists. Uh, they can support the upstream mental health services at the specialist level, which is really great because I know David spoke about that and the need for early intervention. It's relevant across a number of recommendations within sharing the vision, but particularly in recommendations two and 31, 
which identify the use of digital solutions to promote and enhance the delivery of mental health services. Since 2018, the HSE has been prioritising improvements across how the public can learn about and access mental health supports through digital channels. And this includes improvements to our Your Mental Health website, the promotion of our new mental health literacy campaign, and expanding and enhancing the existing digital channels that we have available to us. In 2022, the Sharing the Vision Digital Specialist Group that was mentioned earlier was established to drive and implement those two recommendations that I mentioned. And this group is currently working on a digital mental health action plan, which aims to enhance and develop digital mental health supports for individuals of all ages and experiencing all levels of mental health difficulty. There are a number of models of digital mental health supports that I've included a few examples, and they're just examples because there's so many that you, you couldn't go through them all. But for the wider population, the HSE continues to provide access to reliable and trusted information about mental health and available supports. And this can be found on our Your Mental Health website and through the information line as well. At the next level, you have online uh, self-help options, such as our Balancing Stress Programme, and I know Alicia's here today as well from Health and Wellbeing, um, and dedicated apps for more difficult and challenging mental health um, difficulties such as eating disorders and ADHD that Margot uh, referenced there earlier. So person-to-person -person support is another um, option that can provide a more personalised approach for people that need to get help. And for example, the Text About It service and the Together All platform are examples of that, and I'll go through those in a little more detail. And lastly, that for those that need our more specialised services, there are digital options such as telepsychiatry, and I know uh, Amir Niazi is uh, here as well, so he would know that that can be used um, in, in a hybrid way for, for people. And then there's a range of digital supports for young people, such as live chat and online counselling um, and online support groups. And there's some of our partner organisations like Jigsaw and Text About It as well, and Spun Out, and they provide some great services for young people. As mentioned previously, one of the recent developments in digital mental health is the update to our website. In 2022, it was reconfigured to give it a brand new homepage and new navigation layout. And then new content on common mental health difficulties was also added, which relate to our mental health literacy campaign. And I'll cover that shortly. Um, as you can see on screen, there is a reference to self-help tips. And this reflects the importance of providing that quality information on these common areas of mental health difficulty and to emphasize for the fact that people can actually read about and learn about mental health difficulties and get that information that they need and it might even reduce the need for them actually having to access further support at that particular time. So other key areas of content on the website have also been developed and they include areas around primary care, so our national counseling service and also the CAM service. And I know Don covered a lot of that earlier but the information on how those services can be accessed and who they are best suited for has also been updated. And since those updates have been made, I'm delighted to say that our traffic has increased by over 100%. Um, so as part of the Your, Your Mental Health website updates, uh, the HC has also been developing a great online interactive tool to improve mental health and self-care. So this has been developed by our colleagues in the HSE digital team in collaboration with other colleagues in mental health operations. The core idea was to create a simple way for people to learn more about and how to access mental health supports for their own mental health needs. So an early prototype was actually developed and tested with the public and the results showed a clear preference for a simple questions and answer model. So the My Mental Health Plan will give people four multiple choice questions relating to their quality of sleep, levels of stress, feelings of low mood and anxiety. And then by answering those questions, the algorithm would then take their answers and match the, 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 the list up with relevant supports, resources and tips tailored to their specific needs. So it's due to be launched in uh, February and then we will track that with web analyti analytics, can't speak, um, so that we will see how people are interacting with it and that will inform future developments of what we do with that tool. I will now take you through a couple of slides around the mental health literacy campaign. In October 2022, coinciding with World Mental Health Day, the HSE launched this new campaign. Um, and as was mentioned, I did previously work on the communication side. And for some of you who've been working in this area, you'll know the Little Things campaign, which was all around promoting nine little things that you could do to protect and maintain good mental health. 
this campaign was actually a step above that. It wasn't just about telling people what they could do to, to have good mental health. It was telling them how they could be aware when they actually might need a little bit more support. And it was around highlighting that those common difficulties that we'd all experience, like the sleep issues or anxiety, stress, a little bit of low mood, how that they were all connected to our mental health and they could be signs that we need to reach out and get a bit of support. Um, so obviously it's, it's around increasing awareness and understanding um, and encouraging that help-seeking behaviour. The campaign also helps people make the connections between the difficulties and the different types of supports that are available. So it's really about learning about what's available to you. Since the launch of the campaign, it's been promoted through a range of general media channels such as radio, print, out of home, a lot of transport you can see there on the screen. It was also promoted through a range of digital channels, video on demand, paid search, display, and social media. Um, and I know that social media can be used in a bad way, but for this, it's really about prom promoting the campaign and driving them to the website. Um, so as traditional media has evolved, it was also included in digital audio and on sponsored podcasts. It has performed extremely well. There is 75% of people have said they've heard the ad at least once, and 61% have heard it at least three times. So our digital assets include social media, um, and it's a key component of how we continue to promote the mental health literacy campaign. So some of you may have seen some of these across your own social media feeds. Uh, it's a great way of targeting messages to specific audiences at specific times, so we're able to use them then to highlight specific awareness days. Post-campaign awareness conducted with over 1,000 adults last November found that 80% had a better understanding of mental health and almost 90 admitted that they would then be inclined to go and seek mental health support through the website or other channels. It found still that GPs, family members and friends are still the top source of those people that want to go and get trusted help from something for, for a difficulty they might be experiencing. So we'll continue to monitor the campaign through uh, research, website traffic and our social media engagement. I'll now take you through some of the digital mental health supports and services that are provided by and supported by the HSE. And for these supports and services, we continue to collaborate extensively with our voluntary and community partners, a lot of them are here today, and with other academic institutions to make sure that we're really well informed in how we continue to develop digital. So as touched upon earlier, the Together All platform is really important. It's a digital peer-to-peer -peer support uh, platform for third level students. It was launched in October 2022, with a busy, busy month in October 2022, in partnership with the Psychological Counselors and Higher Education of Ireland. It's available in all publicly funded educations, and it provides 24-7 anonymous support that is clinically moderated. It's available in 14 educations across the country, and you can see a list of the breadth of, of the institutions there. Um, and it reaches almost 225,000 students. So it's jointly funded through the HSE and the Higher Education Authority. And on, on this slide, you can actually see some really interesting me metrics, and I won't keep you um, for, for long, but it's just to show the impact that these services have. Almost two thirds had said that that was the only support that they would actually get. A fifth of them were from ethnic minority groups, and over a quarter had said they considered suicide or self-harm before they had joined the platform. So over 94% of them have stated that they found the platform to be really useful. The HC also funds the text provided service. I know Ian's here today. Um, that also provides 24-7 support for anyone experiencing a mental health or a personal crisis. Um, there's actually, these stats have been updated since, so there's uh, actually over six million messages have been exchanged, um, and text your satisfaction rate of over 80%. And typically they actually wait less than five minutes before they're actually connected to a, to a volunteer. The impact is actually remarkable as well when you consider that over 2,000 escalations have gone through to our emergency services from people that have been using the text of uh, 50808 service. We also offer online guided behavioural therapy for anxiety and depression, and that's delivered by Silvercloud, so some of you be familiar with that. Um, referrals are generally through GPs, over 90% come from our GPs, but primary care psychology, national counselling service, community mental health teams, and Jigsaw as well, anyone over 18 can be referred through. So initially we started working with Jigs or with uh, Silvercloud in 2021 on a pilot basis, and that was more around self-help perspective, but we've since moved then to a guided model where the client is brought through the eight sessions by a trained clinical supporter. The service was rolled out nationally last April, and to date over 10,000 people have completed the programs. 
So an example of some of the people using the Silvergate program just for anxiety can be seen on this slide. The numbers demonstrate, you can see the difference then from people that have gone from severe anxiety at 41% down to 18% after using the program. There's other programs as well, that's just the anxiety one. So this is just a flavor of some of the digital mental health developments that we've uh, been working on. And as mentioned earlier, one of the priorities in relation to sharing the vision is the development of the digital mental health action plan. And I know we have uh, members from the digital specialist group here today and they'd be able to give more detail on that, but it'll provide future direction on this important area of work until the current mental health policy ends, which is in 2030. So this strategy will seek to enhance and develop digital mental health services and supports for individuals of all ages experiencing all types of mental health difficulties, which will ultimately lead to greater accessibility and better outcomes. So I'd like to thank you all for your time today. I'd encourage anyone with a question about digital mental health, you can please get in touch with us. Our email address is there. Um, but updates on digital mental health would also be included in all of the quarterly reports for sharing the vision, and they'll be published on the Department of Health website. So thank you very much. Well done. Thank you, uh, Emer. And again, given our earlier conversations about digital and its dangers and its problems, it's wonderful to see how um, we can use these tools for the good, for the positive, and how many thousands of people are currently using them uh, to uh, support their own uh, uh, mental health. So uh, really great information to have. Thank you so much. Our final session this afternoon is looking to the future. This morning we were looking at NIMIC 1 and the work it had done and how well they thought they had, had done it. This afternoon we're going to finish with the session where we're looking to the future, the job of work that NIMIC 2 uh, is going to take on. And we thought we'd do this uh, in a similar fashion. So the incoming chair, Catherine Brogan, is going to address you uh, first. Uh, and then Martin Rogan, who's the CEO of Mental Health Ireland, is going to facilitate a conversation and introduce uh, some panellists uh, to you. But Catherine, who I know has been mentioned already, um, Catherine lives in Kilcock. She's married with three grown children and is a grandmother of five beautiful grandchildren. Her current role is as President of Mental Health Europe and Chair of NIMIC, as mentioned. She believes strongly in the power of co-production and is passionate about recovery and what can be achieved through having the centrality of lived experience integral to service design and delivery. It sounds like Catherine is just the woman for the job. You're very welcome, Catherine. I've been looking at everybody having to walk from over there across here and I've been saying it's either a catwalk or the green mile. Uh, but it's very daunting. Camille, you've all been sitting down there since two o'clock and I'm sure your backsides are, are a, a bit irritated at this stage. So get up and we'll just do a little stretch because I know we've, ru we've run over time as well. Just going to do a, a, a very small little exercise, and I can see the new the Minic members down there looking, going, "Oh my God, what have we got?" So, just just to move your wrists, just twist your wrists around, and bring them back. And all of the who are good at using your hips, just give a little wiggle of the hips. <laughs> just get that blood flowing down into your feet because it's been stuck somewhere else for the last hour and a half. Give your old shoulders up push them back and forward and take you know you can't actually do this because you'll hit the person beside you but take a good deep breath in blow up the old red balloon in your belly and and if you want to stretch up stretch up there you go give yourself an old shake now well done I am very conscious that, that the time has gone on and I am very conscious that the weather forecast isn't good. So I'm, I'm not going to speak for too long because I haven't even had a first meeting yet. But I'm really, really delighted to be here. And, you know, I was listening to everything today and it's all good news. And, you know, sometimes we don't allow ourselves to actually take that pat on the back and to celebrate good news. Tomorrow we can come back and give out to ourselves again, and we can give out to each other. But today is about celebrating. It's about looking back and saying, we have a sharing the vision document, which is different from vision for change, 
because there is an implementation plan to support it. So, you know, it's been put up to us and we have to achieve it and it's timed and it's actioned and we're being watched by the reference group to make sure we get it done properly and happy days, I'm delighted that we do have that. And then we have the specialist groups there who are down there burrowing underneath, who are given really, really good feedback and up into the NIMIC because the people on NIMIC have day jobs. They're all out there as well with their work hats on. But when they come into the NIMIC and sit down, that hat is left outside the door because they're looking at is right across the domain, right from the promotion of mental health. And that's a population-based approach. That's every single one of us, right through to the access and inclusion, service provision, and then making sure we're accountable and have that governance. So I want to thank um, Minister Butler for putting her trust in me. God help you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a privilege for me. I didn't expect it, to be quite honest. And thank you very much for putting that trust and faith in me and the, the members of NIMIC that I can lead the next four years. I'm really excited that I'll be working with the Department of Health, with the NIMIC committee, with the reference group, with the HSE implementation group, and with the continued support of the specialist groups, new and ones that we will be moving into the future with. People who know me know I'm passionate about mental health in its broadest context. I believe that by working together through co-production, it's actually gone into my middle name now, co-production, but we really need to understand what co-production means. People can bandy the word around and not really actually understand what it means. So, you know, it is about having the right people for the right reason at the right time doing the right recommendations. So, and that changes, you know, so we should be, you should be very mindful of that, that the pool needs to continue to grow. And what we achieve by it, and it's been mentioned by a number of people today, it's not just what we think is needed, it's what we will know is needed because it will have been informed by the right people. I've worked across the statutory, the voluntary, the community sectors, and I've seen one hell of a lot of changes over the 44 years that I have been there. From the recognition of mental health as being an integral part of every one of us, to the development of community mental health services, the meaningful inclusion of people with lived experience, their family members and supporters in the design, development and delivery of services, and I've seen a change in language, in how we speak about mental health and how we have become more focused on recovery and hope. And that word hope is never to be underestimated for any one of us. The work of the first NIMIC and the Hague, the reference group, the specialist groups, and every single person right down to the person who answers the phone in any one of our services. That has laid the cornerstone over the last three years for the implementation plan. Going into the next four years of policy implementation, we're clear, the new, the new mimic, we're clear about what's worked well, because that's been informed to us by the, the current mimic, and also what, needs, what do we need to improve? So we're very mindful of the changing landscape, and that's going to be difficult for us all to navigate, you know, and it is going to present implementation challenges for us. But we need to look at those risks and challenges against the implementation and make sure we clearly articulate what the mitigation plans are going to be there, what the communication plans are going to be there, and also, uh, Fiona, the outcome indicators. So that we're very clear, not just on the individual recommendations, but on the, the sharing the vision as a whole. And uh, our first meeting will be next week on the 26th of January, which I'm looking forward to, uh, to chairing. We're obligated by the end of this year to have the 42 short-term recommendations all done. And along with that, the implementation plan for the next three years after that. So that's putting it up to us, all right. But it's not a paper exercise. And that's what I really want to impress on people. It's not about tick, box done, tick, box done. If you look at the, the, the recommendations and look at each of them individually, there's synergies across them all. 
There's also synergies across all the other policies that um, Minister Donnelly was talking about. So if you look, there, uh, mental health is at the heart of everything. There, as you said, there is no mental health or health without mental health. And if you look at anything from a physical perspective to employment, to housing, to, to anything, workplace, no matter what we're talking about, mental health is an integral part of that. And that will be how we will become successful in relation to making sure that we implement these, this policy. But we want to see it in the next iteration. What we have to start seeing is, well, how is that impact being demonstrated at a local level, at a regional level, and at a national level? And who's saying, who's saying that it's been achieved? What are we hearing from the people who use the service? What are we hearing from the family member supporters supporting those using the service? And what are we hearing about the people who provide the services? Because they go to work every day and they go to work because they care about what they do. And that's both from a statutory perspective but also from a voluntary and community perspective. With regards to the, the um, recommendations, and I remember this conversation so many times when we were doing uh, sharing a uh, vision for change, people might say, I like that one. I don't really like that one. Or I haven't got an interest in that one. But with regards to this, there is none of that. There is no picking and choosing. This is about whole system change. We'll need to make sure that we have the necessary resources, both financial and human. We need to have that supported by IT. We need to have clear communication strategies. Each domain, if you look at it, builds on the other. They're all equally important. That's why there's four. If they didn't need to be four, there'd only be one or two. But there's four for a reason. It's because there's interdependencies among them all. And what we need to be doing is thinking up that high level right across our population about reducing the, um, or strengthening the, the individuals, every person. Strengthening the communities that we all come and live in. But also then the third piece, reducing those structural barriers that are presented to us. For me, and Michael Ryan will love this, because I live by it, I think, and I, I know a lot of people in the room who know me, they live by this too. The key principles of centrality of lived experience, co-production, organisational commitment, and values and learning. These are central to the successful implementation of the Sharing Division of National Mental Health Policy. A policy that provides clear roadmap for change in the understanding and the promotion of mental health and in the design, development and delivery of mental health services that are inclusive and accessible. That's not another piece. That's all integral. Inclusive and accessible. And I think Doreen was alluding to that earlier. And underpinned by strong accountability, governance and transparency. Mental health is everybody's business. We all have a part to play no matter who we are or where we come from. And I look forward to continuing to build on the work that has been commenced and see the impact that can be made in the lives of people who use our services, those who support those who use our services, and also those who work to provide and deliver those services. Thanks very much. Well done. Thank you, Catherine, laying out your, your stall, as it were, uh, for the next number of years. I'm going to invite, I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Martin and ask him to bring his panellists together and he will introduce them to you. Um, and uh, we should finish, I think, maybe about five minutes over time. Thank you. So I've just demonstrated it actually is a catwalk uh, that you walk across here. So folks, we're going to introduce you to the panel, and I think it's really important that sharing the vision is a dialogue. It's a conversation. It's a moving conversation. It's very dynamic. And I suppose for that, almost like an ad break, if you like, you know, three years into a 10-year piece, um, you know, if you can imagine like a time bar ticking across, the question is, are we there yet? Are we pointed in the right direction? Do we have the right people on board? And I think you've heard from Catherine's presentation just the energy and enthusiasm as we move into NIMIC 2, NIMIC the sequel, if you like. But to help us shape this conversation, we have a panel discussion, and we'd like some audience participation in this as well. But just to introduce the panel members, so Derval Ayres, Derval can give you a little wave on that side as well. So Derval was appointed as Assistant National Director of Mental Health Operations at HC just last year, in 2023. 
And in her role, she has day-to-day -day responsibility overseeing all aspects of mental health service on the operational side, and particularly the continuous improvement program. And we heard references to Mark Twain earlier in terms of the importance of continuous improvement. But in her career, Deborah has worked at a local, a regional, and a national level, and brings a lot of expertise and a lot of skill sets into play here as well. She was previously head of mental health service in CHO8 in the Midlands and Loudmead, also in the disability services, and a general manager in primary care. And again, we've heard a lot of discussion today about the importance of each aspect of the health service working in unison and in collaboration, primary care being a key partner there. And she originally trained as a speech and language therapist. And we'll hear from Dervla in just a moment. So, Amanda Burke is, has recently been appointed as the national clinical lead for CAMS and youth mental health. Uh, working closely with Donan, we heard from earlier today. And she's worked as an executive clinical director or ECD in the Galway Roscommon Mental Health Services and also previously as clinical director in the CAM services, uh, in, in the Galway services there as well. She qualified just down the road in Trinity College. I won't say when, GDPR and all that. <laughs> Recently. The, um, but I must say, across her career, she has demonstrated the importance of being really a close listener to young people, their views, their preferences, their needs, how these are understood, and has been a serial innovator right across her career. So I must say, and she's also one of the authors in writing sharing division as well. So you have that fidelity running right through from the authorship to the implementation, which is really, really important. Our next panel member is John Meehan. So John is the Assistant National Director. He also heads up NOSP, National Office for Suicide Prevention, and has played a key role in the last number of years in terms of service planning. And I suppose in this session, we are looking to the future. I think even if we look at an individual, sometimes when people are feeling depressed, they become retrospective and often nostalgic. It requires a degree of optimism to look into the future, look over the horizon, see what the possibilities are, where are we going next, and can we anticipate that future and be ready for it? I think part of John's role has been a key part of that. John's original professional backgrounds in mental health nursing, uh, qualified in, in the UK, worked there for over 13 years, and returned as Director of Nursing in the Sligo Leitrim Mental Health Services, and has been a Senior Manager in HSE, again driving innovation and supporting programmes. And it might be interesting maybe to open up that topic again in relation to pilots. And are pilots exceptions, or do they go to scale and have universal application? We might explore that a little bit when John is talking to us as well. But John has been a key collaborator, and along with myself and a number of colleagues here as well, in 16 different government departments, we've been working on the National Mental Health Promotion Plan, which will be launched in February as well. So we're going to introduce you to the panel and get their thoughts in terms of, on the theme, is looking to the future and the second term of NIMIC. John introduced Catherine a few moments ago, and I suppose that's the phrase that people say, well, the person who needs no introduction is Catherine Brogan. And I think it is her middle name, Catherine Co-Production Recovery Brogan. But just to say yesterday, I was on two different Zoom calls with colleagues in Europe and in Pittsburgh in the States, both of whom referenced Catherine and her work in co-production. So this is a viral concept, and I suppose we found patient zero and the vector, but certainly Catherine has been such an extraordinary, passionate um, implementer when it comes to all things, recognizing the value and the essence of lived experience for the person with a mental health need and indeed their family members. So I think she's going to be a really powerful chair and building on a really strong foundation that NIMIC 1 have put in place. So, Catherine, NIMIC 2, where are we going next? Well, um, I alluded to it, to it there, what our first pieces are going to be. Like, it's putting it up to us really that there are 42 short-term recommendations that have to be implemented. There also has to be a new implementation plan for the medium and long term for the next four years. So that will be a huge a piece of work for the NIMIC when we meet next week will be the first start of that discussion. But we're lucky because the current group have done a lot of work. They've got a, a review done, so that's going to really help to inform us. So we're not going into an abyss looking in to see, well, where will we start? We, have, we already have ideas of where we will be starting. Um, and some of that is, is looking at probably particularly in relation to the reference group and our own, the number of reports that we do, how we, how we f deliver them, the time that we spend on them, maybe 
having uh, less reports but more investment in key areas because we need to, to bring them to conclusion you know, or to get them started and to be very clear around how the resources will be allocated. And you know, one of the things that is bugging me, and I'm reading everything because I'm really reading myself into the role, and I've had great support from John, I've had great support from Philip and the department, they've been amazing. And I have to say thanks for spending all the money today on my induction session, it's really <laughs> above and beyond. But um, you know, I, one of the things that's in the back of my head is the whole restructuring that's happening in, in the HSE and how that is going to impact and what do we need to do to make sure that mental health still stays front and foremost in that? Because there is a risk that things can get lost, you know, when there's change, when everything is being devolved down locally, and there's so many different other issues that are happening. But the role of NIMIC will be to keep the pedal on the metal there for that and to ensure that with the NIMIC and with the department support, that we ensure that what we started will finish as it says in 2030 and not be like vision for change where we did have really really good work and we did do really good uh, interventions through that but we didn't have that end date really copper fastened and we didn't have the same organizational commitment that we do have now Very good. and therefore in terms of from your work and thing as Catherine's reference there uh, vision for change i think when it was published in 2006 there was kind of an expectation we were going to have three mental health services. We were going to have the old traditional one. We were going to have one that was going to do Vision for Change. And we are going to have a third one that was going to do the Mental Health Act. In your role of the day-to-day, -day, keeping the momentum, keeping services rolling, and making sure this isn't a bolt-on, it becomes a, an integral part of your day. How, mm -hmm. how does that sound to you? Well, I think, you know, um, in terms of the, the work that we do within the HSC, particularly within the HIG, that's the HSC implementation group, f as part of the, the NIMIC implementation, uh, impl implementation plan, is looking at how do we keep, there's a, there's a legislation work stream, there's the, the clinical programs work stream, there's all of the other various work streams that keep all of that in mind. But I think our opportunity, I know Catherine mentioned about the structural change within the HSC in particularly, um, that that's an opportunity for integration of mental health care. You know, as long as we're, and I see with my role, um, and that of you know, the youth, Child and Youth Mental Health Office is around supporting, making sure that the, the governance structures and the management structures that are going to be in place in the OREOs support that integrated mental health care, which is a really key priority for us, and also the digital side of things, which has been mentioned numerous times today as well. And a key part of your role is around continuous improvement, recognising best practice as it emerges, but trying to bring that up onto scale and make sure it's not a little island of excellence, but yeah. the whole island becomes better improved. Yeah. I mean, one of our core values in the HSC is around learning, and, uh, and that's something that you know, is really important for us to do. There's a lot of sharing and learning happening among the, the CHOs in particular in mental health services, um, but also like scaling that up when we go into the OREOs, that that's not lost when we go into to change. Um, but I do think coming from a, a former head of service in mental health service and my colleagues around the country who are in head of service roles, that that's something that is close to their hearts to maintain that good learning, sharing, and not to lose that during the change. And I would hope that in the role that I'm in, in head of operations, that that will support that continuous learning and development and best practice. And I suppose I also need to mention uh, Amir in terms of his NCAGL role as a really, really important role in terms of ensuring uh, that clinical evidence-based work is, is, is put into place in terms of the, the models of care, the clinical programs, that we keep a focus on those two. Very good. Okay. And Amanda, in terms of sometimes people talk about children and youth as being the future. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we know we have very immediate needs. We have an enormous demographic around young people. And we know so much more about their needs. How do we anticipate what, what that looks like into the future? Well, I think, I think the key thing that's come through here today is, is integration. And I mean, the Child and Youth Mental Health Office is not just about CAMS. Sometimes people think mental health is synonymous with CAMS. But I think what's exciting is, is this is about the whole spectrum and working with our partner agencies to get the care at the lowest level of complexity, right? <coughs> where the young person needs it and I mean I think it was referenced earlier on in terms of a single point of entry one of the key things that came through in terms of sharing the 
vision was accessibility and an inability to navigate the system. That actually, when you got into it, it wasn't too bad, but you couldn't get into it, or how do you navigate it? So it's about putting in a single point of entry so that, that young people and their families don't have to worry about what door to knock on. There's one door, and it's up to us then to guide them with our partner agencies to the right, the most appropriate, timely intervention. Very good. And to, just to add to that, I mean, we're all banging on about it, but I think it's it's now timely, it's going to happen. We need to have proper data collection and electronic patient records, and I mean, that is imminent for us now, and it's going to make such a difference, not only for the young person's journey and that they won't have to keep retelling the same story because everybody will have access to that, but also for clinical audit. I mean, the audits that we've had to do to date have been laborious because they were paper-based audits. We should be able to do those at the touch of a button and we should be able to repeat them regularly so I'm very excited about bringing that through. Yep and I think I suppose one of the features of today is it's about it's a celebration but it's also a calibration yeah. of where we've come to so the fact that we're able to demonstrate you know, what's been achieved what's moved forward and how we're making progress so electronic patient records can be absolutely invaluable absolutely. in that field. Yeah. Game changer. And John in terms of your role in NOSP and I think again it's been demonstrated through NOSP in terms of interagency working working across various government departments not overwhelming people or burden shifting, but recognizing there are different roles for different players who are best positioned to do that. I think NIMIC takes a similar role in the chairing division. So from your experience, both at NASP and now in the National Mental Health Promotion Plan, working across government departments, across sectors, can be really, really successful. Yeah, I think integration is a word that is used loosely, but I think the proof is in the pudding now. Um, I suppose the if you look at what we have in the, in, in the context of policy now, we have uh, sharing the vision, we have the imminent health promotion plan, and we have connecting for life, which th this is his last year. Um, and if, to inform everybody, we have a, a, we've procured a, an evaluation partner and the evaluation of connecting for life is, um, is starting in February. And I suppose uh, the minister mentioned earlier that when she came in to post, um, sharing the vision was just launched and I can tell you, that the minister not one for launching and leaving things. There has to be, a, uh, you know, a progression in that. And I think that the integration you, you've seen through the presentations today, and it's real integration. So we've got Solange Care looking at the regions and looking at how we're going to uh, provide services on a national basis. From a mental health point of view, we've got sharing the vision. We've got connecting for life, which will be renewed. Um, and we're adamant in our office, and I'd like to say hello to my colleagues from NASP here today is that we, there won't be that delay, that sharing the vision and vision for change, mm -hmm. that it works coterminously and along with that. Um, and I think, you know, mental health is a small um, constituency when you look around the room here. A lot of people know each other. Uh, but integration has to happen in the way forward. With the health promotion plan, um, you know, the fundamental part of that is integration. Uh, connecting for life would not work without integration. Um, sharing the vision, governance, learned from Connecting for Life, and I'm sure through the evaluation, Connecting for Life in the new order will learn from sharing the vision as well, and that's what it's all about. Excellent. Yeah. And I think we've heard from some of our colleagues today, particularly from a WHO perspective, sometimes when WHO is looking at illnesses or diseases, they talk about communicable and non-communicable. I think after the last four years, we know what a communicable disease looks like. But sometimes mental health is considered non-communicable because we're not always good at telling our story. Uh, and that's why days like this are so important. And I think as Emer demonstrated earlier, the part of using digital assets, or as David demonstrated, mm -hmm. having really good data that says, this is not a cost, this is an investment. And uh, an investment has huge return in human condition, but also financially and indeed for the state. As we said, this is a discussion. And if you have some questions, we have some roving mics making the way around the room as well. If we have any questions for our panel members in terms of as we look into the future, mm -hmm where we'd like to go next. I'd just like to ponder that question, but Catherine, do you want yeah, to come in again? It's just uh, when you were speaking there and when John was speaking there, and you know, I think mental health can stand up and really be counted, and particularly Connecting for Life. The way that the reports and the way that Connecting for Life, the cross-sectoral group works, there is so much that we could take from that to implement with sharing the vision. But I'm just looking around and I'm there seeing all of us in this room we're probably all anoraks. We're involved in this from the grassroots in whatever hat we wear. But the communication of what we're doing needs to go beyond ourselves. 
in the mental health field. We need to look at, and that's one of the, the recommendations that's come out of the review, how do we communicate more around what is happening in mental health? And, you know, even getting in the public to understand, you know, so it's not always that awful piece of news that gets the, 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 the traction, but all the good pieces of work that are happening, because it can so much overshadow and it can deflate people and it can actually impact on people who are already vulnerable. So you know, how can we, and I'll be looking to people to see, help us in that, how can we be more out there in relation to communicating what's happening well? And also then in that finding out, well, how do we know it's happening well? Because who's telling us? Where are we seeing that? And it's a bit like this morning, and I hate the word pilot, I always call it proof of concept. So much better to prove the concept, then you can really get, a, get the traction on it. But, you know, how do we make sure that what's happening in Cork is the same in Donegal, given the nuances as well of each community being itself? Going back into our communities, and one of the areas that have been, it's been led out by Mental Health Ireland, but it is international, is the whole area of Thrive. And that's the upstream piece that David's talking about, about the mental health promotion piece. And, you know, that's a population-based approach. So it's not the population minus people with mental health challenges. It's everybody. Because you can have a very severe mental health challenge, but still be mentally healthy. So it's about looking at all of these pieces together and really building a communication plan where everyone can see they have a role to play in this. Because the bottom line is, there'll be more of us at work, we'll be enjoying more, our work more, we'll be having better families, more housing, uh, you know, all the things that we're talking about, the cross-sectoral piece that we see working really well in, in uh, Connecting for Life, how, how do we get that also tied into sharing the vision? And everyone standing up and saying, I'll have a bit of that. Yeah, and I think a, a phrase we've heard a few times today, whether it's proof of concept or pilot, and sometimes when a manager is presented with a decision that's a costly decision, and in the same way, a parent might pat a child on the head and say, we'll see. We say, we'll do a pilot. It's kind of a soft no. And there are lots of pilots out there. Some of them are kamikaze pilots that have no landing gear and don't know how to come down. But John, how do we make sure that we move when we have the evidence, when we can actually strongly evaluate either independently or from outcomes, to take that pilot to scale? How do we make sure that all the population can avail? Well, I think through evaluation as well of, and looking at the evidence, and one of the things, um, it was mentioned earlier, and I wrote it down, uh, I think it was Siobhan McHale that mentioned about that tension. Uh, Catherine calls it proof of concept, I call it learning sites. I don't like pilot uh, myself neither. But I think um, we need, mental health needs to move forward into a public health realm and a response to public health and be seen as part of that. We, and I think, you know, under the new order and particularly within um, sharing the vision and uh, connecting for life in the new order. The social determinants and commercial determinants of health um, needs to be addressed. And I think, David, you know, you and I have spoken about that in the past. And, and also looking at um, the evidence base, but not be afraid to evaluate and to take the learning from mm. the evaluation. Because mm -hmm. not everything we do will work. No. Uh, and we must, you know, be able to say, well, actually, that didn't work. Let's move on. And... Um, I think that would be the message for myself. And with Slauncher Care, the integration, we must ensure mental health does not get lost. In the, you know, we've seen what happens when that boat uh, got stuck in the Suez Canal and the way it clogged everything else up. You know, changing mental health is the same, but if we do it little but often, is the way to go, in my opinion. But the learning from it as well. Um, and not be afraid of evaluation. And Dervil, in your role in terms of um, you know, making sure that we have consistency, you know, under the new model, we'll have a population-based resource allocation. Things are often quite uneven historically for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. How do we get that universal access and service quality, you know, making sure clinical programs have fidelity and, and that actually happens in three dimensions? Yeah, um, I think we can't separate the, the structural change in the HSC and what that will mean for governance and management structures and how services are delivered um, will be a key part in that, really, in terms of that. And certainly within the, the national service, it will be trying to make sure that that oversight is there to ensure that mental health is still at the table, supported in terms of shared care and learning and consistency in population-based approaches, of course. Um, 
coming in through those management structures, they're supported to be able to provide that um, through both John's office, my own, the primary care disability, because it, it's, it's all about shared care and particularly a focus on shared care and primary care as well, uh, going forward with mental health services and health and wellbeing. So I think it's a, it's a look across all how we can support it and also ensuring, re respecting that the new structures are going to be in place and they will be, I suppose, responsible for their own delivery for their own populations. But um, having that mental health as core part of the integrated care provision in a shared care manner. Very good. Are possible. Okay. And Amanda, in terms of, we're seeing it probably for the first time ever, an extraordinary level of alignment between government ambitions, departments, HSC, structures, clinicians. So we're all on the same hymn sheet. What makes you most optimistic about the future, and particularly in this new role? Yeah, well, I, th I think it is really exciting that we are all aligned and that I suppose um, being biased here today, I mean, how often has youth mental health, I've heard mentioned more today than I had in the previous 10 years at conferences. So I think we need to harness that energy, but act now. And I suppose I'm, I'm thinking back in, in COVID and, and Mike Ryan and the WHO saying, you know, don't let perfection get in the way of, of get, just get on, let's get on with this. Yeah. That's, there's energy here now and let's get on. You can call them learning sites, exemplars, whatever we're doing, but we need to get on. We have, we, we want to get on with a single point of access. We need to do that this year, not next year, they think. Um, and to, to look at the CAMS hubs, to, to develop them in terms of, we, you know, we saw the economic benefit there of early intervention in eating disorders in particular. And I mean, we had a massive increase in COVID stabilised and what now. But actually, we can see the impact now on our um, admissions for eating disorder beds of the teams on the grounds. And I mean, admission to hospital, as you know, for a young person is huge. So, so I mean, I think we're starting to sit to reap the, the rewards of the clinical programmes and the investments, but I think we just need to keep the momentum going and we need everybody on the one page. Um, there's plenty of work for everybody here, you know, we don't need to be fighting with each other. <laughs> Absolutely. Just wondering if we have any brief questions before we close today, because um, I see this is uh, an exercise in audience participation. I think as Catherine said, maybe it's an occupational hazard for us that we talk to ourselves and maybe we need to talk to a much wider audience. And there are lots of people who want to help, want to be part of this whole movement. Sometimes a little bit unsure, are they doing the right thing or is this useful or the most effective way to go forward? I think there's an open invitation here and I can see the energy and enthusiasm for that. Just wondering, have we any questions before we close? Philip, we'll just wait to get a mic to you there. So, thanks guys, I've had a pleasure of working with you over many years. Uh, and as John said, it's, it's probably a very small world, but I've seen a massive change over mental health services in the last number of years, uh, all for the better. And I know things move slowly. If you were to wave that magic wand in the morning, what's the one thing you would like to have as your wish? Okay. Is that you? Is that me? Yeah. Anius. John, go for it. <laughs> okay. Okay, that, a good question, Philip, as always. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would have to say the introduction of the patient record and appropriate data uh, that allows us to ensure that we're, we're providing services is appropriate and to the right place, to the right person, in the right time. And again, I, it's so important to say, and Mandy, it was Mark Twain that said it, uh, continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I would agree with you totally in that one, yeah. Okay, because I sometimes look like a leprechaun, I'm gonna grant all the members of the panel the same wish. So, um, Amanda? Oh, well, he got in before me, as always. <laughs> <laughs> he does that, he does that. <coughs> the, it, without a doubt at the moment, the PR, it's, it, we're, we're so far behind. We just need it, and we need it now. Yeah. And we can jump forward in terms of probably some of the more primitive models that were not always successful, so at least we're going in. Uh, you know, with, with yeah, I, but I think we should go for t top of the range, not interim, just get, go in there and there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and because the change involved, as anybody who's introduced an EPR, is, is huge for the system, and um, you don't want to do it more than once. No. You know, we want to get in there, get the right system, and, and start to use it. Very good. Beverly? Um, a 
Okay, well, I, I, I um, reinforce what they have said, but really uh, a, a key thing for me would be infrastructure um, across the board, because I think for um, both our staff and the people who access our services, they deserve to be in modern fit for purpose buildings and uh, approved centres. So for me, if there was a bottomless pit of money and a bottomless pit of builders and uh, all the rest, that would be a dream. Yeah. Okay. I think when you've Minister Butler behind you, you can be fairly confident that a <laughs> good capital program. She has a strong track record in that area as well. Put buildings and uh, infrastructure out there, you know, but we just like to build it, you know, bring it all to a certain level, you know. So that would be, a, well, be wonderful. But it is, it's a very tangible sign of respect for people using services and indeed for staff that they have facilities that, that are of the top level. Catherine. Probably a little bit different. I would like, if I had a magic wand, no silo working, everybody respectful of each other, and the trust that Nicola mentioned this morning, that we have that trust between each and every one of us that we can do together, and not to be afraid to work together or share resources or share good practices. Trust and no silos. So again, we'd like to thank our panel members and for our audience participation there as well. And we're going to pass back to Grania, who is going to bring us towards the end of the day as the Minister will, will address us then. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. Yeah, thank you to the panel. Really interesting look forward. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for your participation, for your active listening. I could see that looking around the room and really for coming back in time when we asked you to come back in time because it makes my job a nightmare, as you know. Finally, finally, and I want to echo the comment that was made earlier on. I'd say I've done a few dozen of these kinds of big conferences in here. This is the first one I've ever been at that a minister stayed for the whole day. And I just want to pay due for due is. And that's not to criticise others who obviously are very busy, but I do think it is a mark of this woman's commitment. So she's going to make some closing remarks. So for me, thank you, everyone, and I hope you had a good day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gráinne, and I'm going to keep it short and sweet. We all have to head home, and I do have to get home to Waterford this evening. Um, firstly, can I have a big bowl of buzz for Dr. Gráinne Healy, um, moderator extraordinaire, kept us all on time. <laughs> so I just want to thank everybody for coming here today. I, I think the list of speakers, the panel discussions, the conference itself, the first of its kind and, and the start of many, I hope. I feel it has been a great success. Um, like Gronia, I've been at many conferences. I've never been at a conference before where everyone stayed in the room, where phones weren't buzzing, where people weren't popping out for a coffee and a chat and the conference was going on outside. I've never seen that before. And I think, I suppose, what it cements for me is that everybody here in the room wants to see um, you know, positive um, changes uh, for, 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 our, for all of our mental health and for all of the service delivery. Um, we heard from the tea shop this morning briefly and we also heard from Minister Donnelly and Minister Donnelly is right. We need to see th seize this moment. The speakers have said this today. We need to seize this moment, the opportunity, drive on and deliver um, the best services that we possibly can and putting the service users front and centre. I think today we have learned a lot in relation to the National Implementation and Monitoring Committee, the work they do, the reference groups, the service users, the lived experience, the peer support, the stigma reduction. And I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who are, who are part of NIMIC, um, who play a role, who give up their time, who volunteer. It costs you money. You drove here today, you traveled here today. And you know, NIMIC could not happen without our pool of fantastic volunteers. So thank you very much for that. Um, a couple of standout points, Dr. Lazeri, uh, wise words I felt about spending better. We can always spend better. I love to get into the weeds of things. I love value for money. And I delve down um, in, 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 into are we getting um, the best value we can. Um, Professor David McDade, I would listen to you forever. 
You are an absolutely um, amazing speaker. Your economic case for investment. But I was really struck by your piece in relation to loneliness, and I'm not going to delve into um, my older person's brief and speaking about loneliness, but it's a massive issue at the moment, and it can lead on to emotional distress and just challenges with mental health. But uh, thank you um, very much for your time here today. You've sat here all day too, all day long, and like many others, so thank you for that. I think it would be remiss of me not to touch briefly on CAMS, because I feel that um, CAMS teams, the 75 of them, the length and breadth of the country, have taken a hammering over the last 18 months. And there's some people here that work across CAMS teams, and they do a phenomenal job. We've 800 people working in CAMS. We've 76 consultant psychiatrists working in CAMS. They do a phenomenal job with the resources that are available to them. And I was really pleased to get the report from the, the Mental Health Commission and the HSE Independent Audit because we have data that we never had previously and we're going to be able to work with that data going forward to do the very best we can. And with the extra 10 million again today, you know, that is going to be um, cemented into youth mental health CAMS teams across the board. And I suppose the reason why I say this, I was speaking at an event in Kerry uh, a couple of months ago now, and it was, I'm, I'm trying to remember what it was, it was an age-friendly forum, and afterwards we were having a cup of coffee, and I was speaking to her, sitting beside a person, and she told me she works for the HSE. So she's one of the 12,300 people, whole-time equivalents, who work for the HSE in mental health. And she said to me, I actually work in CAMS, but I don't tell anybody. I actually work in CAMS, but I don't tell anybody. Because she said, we just get so much abuse on social media. And Minister Donnelly spoke about social media. So every time I speak on the media, every time I speak in public, I always try to build as much confidence as I can in our CAMS teams. They're doing a phenomenal amount of work. 225,000 appointments were issued to children last year. 225,000 appointments. For every two children that are coming into CAMS, there's only one leaving because the cases are more complex. And you know this better than I do, but I do believe that it would have been wrong of me not to say this. And we're going to do our level best to try and put the resources in place, to try and build up the CAMS teams, to try and make sure you know, that we can break down that siloed nature. Maybe culture changes are needed too across some areas, but we will work really, really hard um, to support the CAMS teams going forward. A couple of areas didn't get a mention today. Great progress has been made in relation to perinatal mental health supports across all maternity ho hospitals in the country. I'm really, really proud of that. Every single maternity hospital has perinatal mental health um, supports. Um, eating disorder teams. We now have 10 eating disorder teams, seven operational, three partially, five adults and five CAMs. More to do, but we're getting there. Dual diagnosis last year, I launched a model of care, and we are now recruiting into three services in different parts of the country. Also launched a model of care for CAMs hubs and the model of care for crisis resolution teams. So a huge amount of work has been done in the last 12 months, which wasn't possible initially, I suppose, um, because of COVID. And I also want to touch on the first time ever that my budget was able to provide funding um, to the tune of 750,000 recurring funding to support uh, the education of counselling psychology students and this funding will, will continue and I do think that's also really really important that didn't happen before and I see Mark Smith sitting down there in the room and he was in my ear for a long time and it paid off because I do listen. Um, just want to touch on the publication of the mental health bill and we just got press release while we were sitting down there. So this session in, uh, under legislation is really, really short. It's only nine weeks. So the bill is still for the fourth time on priority drafting because there's a few tweaks that needs, need to have, happen. But I, am, I met with the, um, the whip last week and, and the Attorney General's of, office and I am told it will be priority publication in the next session, but this session is only nine weeks long, so that means that, that I will get it before the Oireachtas, um, before the summer, and I'm really looking forward to getting that. It, it, it has been a huge amount of work, and I want to, um, I want to thank um, James and his team for all the work that they have done on it. He has been buried in that piece of legislation for the last three years, and uh, James and Lorraine as well has been working on it, so I just want to say thanks in relation to that. Um, I just want to say, just before I finish, we're all here today for a purpose. We're all here today to try and improve um, all, of our, all of our people living in this country in relation to their mental health. And I think sometimes people do confuse mental health illness 
and acute mental health challenges with emotional distress, um, you know, their well-being. Like I met somebody last week and he said to me, all I want is peace of mind. And for a lot of people, that's what we do. We need peace of mind. And, you know, sometimes I just think that everything is just put in under mental health. But, you know, I really think today of all those people that have enduring and everlasting mental health conditions. I think of those that are in our, our, our approved centres still in the breadth of the country. I think of those that find it difficult. And, you know, we didn't touch on it today because you'd want a full week to talk about the issues we have in relation to mental health and addiction challenges. But I do think if we can harness the energy that was here in the room today, I think we will make an awful lot of progress. So just before I finish, I just want to thank, thank the unit and the mental health unit in the department for the fantastic work. I want to thank Neve for organising today. Neve is just after stepping out, but she did she's there. She did phenomenal work. And I also want to thank Oshin for your work um, in NIMIC. Oshin has moved away from me as well. Oshin does phenomenal work um, with NIMIC. And um, when you start thanking people, you, you run into trouble. But there's one person here that I'm not going to leave the room without thanking, and that's Professor Philip Dodd. Thank you, Philip, for your wise, comprehensive advice and support to me. Um, and, of course, um, led the mental health team in the department, led by Siobhan Hargis. Uh, I just want to say thank you. One of the things that was really important to me after being three years Minister for um, Minister of State for Mental Health and Older People, last 12 months ago, um, the Taunashta had a decision to make at the time whether he would make changes and I was hoping and praying that I could stay in this job. So I'm now three and a half years into the job. But because we had COVID for two years, an awful lot of the work that we wanted to achieve couldn't have been achieved because we were buried. Like everybody else in this room, we did an awful lot of work to do in relation to COVID. So having the opportunity, um, having the opportunity as we enter the last year of this government, so no pressure on everyone living in the room, our, our, everybody here in the room, I will be looking for delivery. Um, from everyone. So thank you very much indeed and safe home.